Well, thank you all for joining us for this World Council of Credit Unions and International Cooperative Banking Association webinar, Sharing Digitization Strategies Among Credit Unions and Cooperative Banks. My name is Greg Newman. I'm Director of Communications for World Council. WOKU and the ICBA are joining forces to allow members of both organizations to learn from one another today about the different approaches to establishing the digitization of back office operations and customer facing online and mobile services. Today, we'll see presentations from some of the top digitization professionals working at credit unions and cooperative banks around the world, including Carrie Price, Senior Vice President of Digital Strategy and Delivery for Baxter Credit Union, better known as BCU here in the US, Dr. G.R. Shintala, Chair of the National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development in India, Dohun Kwan, IT Platform Quality Assurance Officer for the National Credit Union Federation of Korea. And finally, we'll hear a joint presentation from Miroslav Skiba, President of the Board of SGB Bank in Poland, and also Vojta Mika, Vice President of the Board at SBG Bank. If you have any questions for our speakers today, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type them in there. We'll ask them of the speakers as time permits. And also, we want to let you know today's webinar is being recorded. It's going to be available later today on the World Council YouTube channel. That's at youtube.com slash woku, youtube.com slash woku. And we're going to start today with some opening remarks from Brian Branch. He is World Council's president and CEO, and also Bhima Subramanyam. He is the president of the International Cooperative Banking Association. Brian? Thanks, Greg. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks to our colleagues at the International Cooperative Banking Association and the International Cooperative Alliance. Very important topic that we're addressing today. We're living in the time of challenge 2025. This is a time for the digital transformation of the global credit union system. And as we have talked, very important today that we have our core services available online and via mobile channels and that we integrate our credit union systems with national payments ecosystems. So we have the great opportunity today to share the experiences and explore the learnings from our cooperative colleagues from the International Cooperative Banking Alliance. Thanks, Greg. Hello, Thanks, Bima. Brian. And Bima, would you like to say a few words? You're, you're muted, Bima. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Greg and Mr. Brea. In fact, the need and importance of the digitalization, one may term it as digitalization, assumes greater significance in the ever-changing financial sector reform scenario. The developments in the banking sector, which includes a growing number of different forms of financial channels, payment methods, the mergers, amalgamations, regulatory functions, customer needs and services, need for compliance of prudential norms, et cetera, has to look forward towards appropriate digitalization practices to address the issue at ease. Digitalization, in fact, should also be viewed as a part of the information communication technology, which emerged as an important tool in the era of technology. Adoption of international communication technology helps to improve quality of customer service, reduction of cost of management, better management of risk, increase in productivity and enhance competitiveness. The Indian banking sector, like many other cooperative financial institutions in other parts of the world, is front runner in adoption of ICT. Against this background, the International Cooperative Banking Association of ICA, in close collaboration with WOKU, contemplated our first ever joint webinar on the current very important theme. OKU has been providing an excellent service to their member credit unions all over the world, and ICBA has been contributing its might to their member cooperative financial institutions. My highest appreciation to Dr. Brian Branch, President and CEO, who readily consented to this kind of arrangement and offered to host the Zoom meeting. As agreed, we have identified two speakers with expertise and highest reputation in their respective countries, on behalf of ICBA, one from India and two from Poland. Let me also place my gratitude to Mr. Rafael Matusiak, chair of the WOKU Board of Directors, who believed that there is a scope for better cooperation between ICBA and WOKU. 
with these few introductory remarks, I endorse the opening of the webinar proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bay. Thank you so much, Bhima. I appreciate your cooperation in, in putting this together as well. Now let's go to our first presentation of the day. Carrie Price is Senior Vice President of Digital Strategy and Delivery for Baxter Credit Union, or BCU as it's known here. In that role, Carrie leads BCU service and digital delivery channels with the goal of deepening engagement and loyalty among BCU members. Carrie creates the optimum member experience by bridging technology, people, and the digital experience to the service channels. Carrie Price, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Greg. It's a pleasure to talk to all of you and thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm going to share in, in this presentation lessons of our digital maturity at BCU, but, but I read recently there's no endpoint to the digital transformation, so I think we're all on this digitization journey together. So a little bit of background on BCU. So to give you some context, um, BCU is a credit union located outside of Chicago, Illinois. We have about 300,000 members, 700 employees. Our assets are about 5 billion. And our footprint extends coast to coast in the United States in Puerto Rico with 63 branch offices. Um, I say here, you know, we have our capital reserves and our capital ratio. And our North Star, and I'll talk about this later, is our net promoter score. And we track that. This is our transactional net promoter score for our credit union, which we report to our board and is very, very important to us. So our BCU strategy, which is important, um, our roots began with Baxter, and that's on the left-hand side of this screen. Baxter is a healthcare company very close to us in Deerfield, Illinois. So BCU started the roots in, in healthcare, but we've expanded over the years to other household names such as Target and most recently Geico. So this is important and I wanted to bring this up because it's very relevant to share how the business approach for our credit union shapes how we think about our digital offering to our members. So our approach is to bring on companies into the credit union who have an interest in the financial well-being of their employees. And we wanna be a benefit offered to these company partners in the form of a B to B to C model. So that's a little bit of our structure. And I wanna show how this fits into our digital approach because this is one of the lessons learned. So the lesson before was who do you serve? Um, so understanding who we serve. But another lesson is tying our, our digital strategy to our overarching credit union objectives. So B, at BCU, we have three overarching objectives. It's to make sure that we have engagement, we have excellence, and, and we focus on experience. So I'll tell you how that kind of translates into our digital strategy. Um, so in terms of our digital channels, improving engagements, which you'll see on the left-hand side of your screen, we want to deepen the penetration of products and services of our members using our channels. We also care about that second box that says serve the growing remote membership. At BCU, about 65% of our target market doesn't have a branch location that they can visit. So we have to make sure that we have digital features that attract them and whose primary channel is strictly digital. The next one is expenses. We wanna reduce expenses and that's under that excellence category. So we can do that by enhancing security features such as additional um, authentication layers at login so that we can reduce fraud expenses. At BCU, we compare our contact channels versus our contactless. Contactless being ATMs, it being digital. And we've been tracking that for years, and I'll get um, to more of that later on, but our contactless channels are about 20 times um, less expensive than our contact channels. So we make sure that we track those contactless channels so that we can also reduce expenses and, and increase self-service. And then the last one here on the right-hand side is member effort. We have been striving to reduce member effort for years reducing friction in our member experience and making it easier for us to do business with um, BCU across all of our member channels. So this is how we know we're gonna improve um, loyalty as well. So the lesson here 
is bridge our business objectives to our digital strategy. So in this next one, um, so this is more about the how. So how do we go through this, this digital journey? And, and I just wanna share <clears throat> again, our lessons in this. So I would ask if we were um, in, in a big room, I would ask how many of you have a digital strategy? And then I would ask um, how, how you plan on executing that strategy. I will share three questions that VCU that we've asked ourselves in forming our digitization strategy. And the first one is the build by decision. And I would ask you, would you build, do you buy, or do you go hybrid? And this pendulum on the right really represents our journey. So historically, when I started out, we didn't have anybody in our digital team. Um, and, and we decided to build our digital banking platform in our IT area. And it was very successful for us, but that was before the ubiquity of mobile banking. So as our member demands increased and the complexity increased, we knew that we had to go from a build solution to, to a buy solution because of the complexity. So we decided to buy a platform that had both the desktop banking and the mobile banking, and there was more consistency. So that's where we, that's where we were um, in, in our journey there to, to bridge both the desktop and the mobile. But then we had to ask ourselves, well, how fast do we want to go? That was another um, question. So we decided that at BC, we wanted to be a fast follower with what I'll call our commodity transactions. So that's transfers, our balance inquiries, where we didn't think we really could differentiate in the market. We wanted to be a fast follower there, but we wanted to be a standout where we had a unique digital opportunity. And I'll share more about that later. The last question that I would ask and that we ask ourselves is, and so how are we gonna accelerate the velocity of digital? So this really gets to the first one about the build by. So at BCU, we decided we wanted to, where we couldn't build um, and we wanted to buy, we sought out FinTech partners to do that and made sure that we could be strategic in those integrations into our digital ecosystem. So those are the three questions that we've asked ourselves along our digital journey. So, as we, as we think about um, our digital journey, we realized that what got us here won't get us there. And so this is a slide that I showed to my board years ago. Um, and it, it really talked about, at first we started out very physical branches, a focus on branches. And as we evolved, we went very much into digital, but it didn't stop there. And we realized what got us here won't get us there. And we needed to think about digital even um, more deeply. And so what this um, slide shows is really that evol ev uh, evolution to get to more advanced digital. And now what we are aspiring to is even I would say the extreme digital. So this Dell um, digital banking maturity model I think articulates that really well. So as we go down this continuum, we wanna, uh, we wanna as we aspire I should say and get to the point of zero paper, one touch application. And so our members have a very frictionless journey. So we wanna interact with our members whenever and wherever. So my lesson here is we needed to evolve our strategy. Just getting to digital wasn't enough, but we needed to evolve. Which really led to the next one and that's our digital strategy 2.0, I will call it, which is again, another lesson. So we, when we ask ourselves, how, do we, uh, how is the acceleration of digital helping us to go where we want to. We decided at ECU to evolve this strategy 2.0 for digital, that we wanted to be digitally defensive with product feature development and digitally offensive where experiences would provide a unique positioning with those company partners that I mentioned before, the Target, the Geico, the Baxters. So we think about that as we create digital solutions. I'll give you one example. So where we wanna be digitally offensive and more on this continuum of be, being more of an innovator is that recently we rolled out a financial well-being assessment for our company partners. This assessment helps that member engage to where they are in their financial well-being journey. And we did that for our company partners so that we could show more value. 
So that was something that unique that was unique to us that we rolled out to them to make us more digitally offensive. <clears throat> so as we think about our digital capabilities, we wanted to make sure that we're keeping pace with being digitally offensive, but we knew that we needed to make a big change in our digital approach. So in stepping back and looking at our business and looking out to digital um, 2022, we knew we needed to segment our digital business into five different categories. It wasn't enough to have our team set up to be mobile and desktop, but with the pervasiveness of digital and also our internal product teams like lending, um, having an appetite for more digital solutions, we needed to break our digital team into these five areas to give more specific focus. So we did that by creating a focus on sales enablement, by making sure that we keep up with those mega banks and those features that the banks are offering to be a fast follower um, in our competitive digital offering. We wanted to have a focus on member trust and security, knowing how important that was, especially now with the pandemic and the acceleration of digital and people buying more through their phones. We wanted to make sure that we focused on trust and security and also on omni-channel solutions like video chat and making sure that we offered solutions that our members could engage us in an omni-channel way. And then lastly, creating a, 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 a dedicated team for corporate partnerships. How do we provide solutions to our company partners? And that's how VCU is designed and built around our, our SAG partners. So we wanted to make sure that, that we did that and, <coughs> excuse me, that aligned to our, to our strategy. So again, tying that strategy. So this is really the next one is, is how we did that. So we reassessed our strategy. We looked for a new platform. We knew we needed to have speed to market and execute on those features. But our current structures, I said, could not do that. So we needed to move to more of an agile methodology in our digital development. I completely redid every job description in our entire digital team. And we needed to revamp and upskill our team so that we could deliver on that new strategy. The lessons here, I would say, is in this last bullet point, and that's the change management mindset and sharing your digital journey with your entire organization. And that's one thing that I would say is a, is a lesson is how are you sharing your digital strategy and your digital direction with the entire organization, and in our case, our board of directors because it is so entrenched in our business. So when I think about how is this measured and what is success, I just wanted to share a few, few graphs that we share with our board of directors um, every month and also with our senior management team. So these are goals of how we're performing, how we're accomplishing. So the first one is digital activation. We measure, measure digital activation and we share that with our board every month. The next one on the right-hand side is contactless transactions. We took our entire transaction set for the credit union and broke those down into contact and contactless and worked with our branches to move those low value transactions to digital where it was uh, more cost effective and where our branch team could spend more time being very consultative in driving deeper integrations with loans and with more business with our members. Our goal was to hit 95% of all of our transactions to be contactless by 2020. And, and definitely the pandemic helped that when some of the branches were closed, but we were on a great trajectory with a lot of focus from our entire organization who did a great job in that. And then the bottom right-hand side is just a snippet of our digital dashboard. We send this out every month to our senior leadership team. And again, this goes back to being transparent with our digital journey um, within our credit union and within my, the stakeholders that, that support us. So at the bottom right, you'll, you'll see some of these other um, uh, metrics are included in here, but we also share that net promoter score. We definitely see that as our North Star. It's included in our digital dashboard every month because we know that without making sure we have great experiences with our members and we serve them well and give them great digital solutions, they are what, what matters. They are what builds our credit union. And we want to make sure that we make their financial lives easier. So with that, um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Appreciate it.
Carrie, I think I speak for probably everybody on the webinar when I say, wow, um, just both the presentation and also what BCU has accomplished and the way you guys continue to evolve. You know, two things stood out to me in that presentation. One was 65% of your members don't have access to a physical branch, I think you said, and then now almost 100% of your transactions are contactless. Um, are you at a point where things stop moving forward now or things stop having to evolve or is that never the case with the way things are going? You know, I don't think, Craig, it ever stops. And I was saying that in the beginning, I think we are all on this digital transformation journey. And, and I, I don't think it stops. I think that we continue to focus um, on, on digital, but we also really feel like that face-to-face -face with our branch footprint is important too. Um, so we don't think we'll ever give up our call center channels. We see a lot of growth in our call center channels now, um, even though some of our branches are starting to open up because of the pandemic. Um, we really want to make sure that when we have that opportunity, um, and we still feel like there will be those opportunities to speak to our members or to see them face to face, we want to provide as much value as we can by migrating, as I mentioned, those low value transfers. Um, maybe it's it's a payment. We want to move those to our digital um, our digital experience, but really um, reserve that face to face, that precious time for those high value transactions. Well, I wish we had even more time, Carrie. Thank you so much for the presentation. If anybody does have questions for Carrie, please use the Q&A button. We'll try to get those to her as time permits. Thank you uh, but we're going to, you bet, thank you. We're gonna switch now over to the cooperative banking sector. Dr. G.R. Chintala is chair of the National Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development or NABARD in India. He's a champion for spreading financial inclusion to rural areas through digital transformation. Dr. Chintala originally joined the bank as an officer and worked in various capacities at the head office in Mumbai and in several regional offices. He was also the vice president of Agribusiness Finance Limited, Hyderabad, and the director of Bankers Institute for Rural Development. Dr. Chintala, I know you're still getting settled there, but welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here and address uh, such kind of an August gathering world over. And I'm extremely <clears throat> grateful for giving me this opportunity to speak on the digitization and the digitalization. My previous speaker, Carrie, had given a beautiful presentation, which was almost like a textbook prescription, which most of the banks uh, are following. But I want to give a kind of a reality check as to really what exactly is happening in the Indian cooperative movement. Now, in India, we have a plethora of institutions like commercial banks, cooperative banks, small finance banks, regional rural banks, and others. The digitization had happened to various at various levels and to varied degrees. Now, commercial banks in India have almost <clears throat> are at par with uh, the banks in the West, and they are on the core banking solution. They are offering the, almost all the uh, solutions which are required by the customers, and uh, they're both remotely and also in the contact, contactless, every kind of a thing. But at the same time, as chairman of NABAD, who is supervising the entire cooperative system, particularly the rural cooperative credit system, I have a, a kind of a take as to really where we stand with regard to the digitization in cooperatives in the country. So this is what I just want to bring to the notice of the August gathering. First of all, it's a good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, <clears throat> depending on the geographies uh, from where you have logged in. I just want to give a very uh, a reality check and also really what exactly we are doing with regard to the digitization of the cooperative movement in the country. I restrict my talk exclusively to the cooperatives. As I told, uh, uh, this particular seminar is about the cooperatives. Now, as you are aware, India is the second most populous country with uh, close to around 1,370 million people. And in the same breath, I can say that we have so many cooperatives also. We have close to around 600,000 cooperative societies with a membership of around 250 million. These cooperatives have a huge network and reach with almost 100% coverage of the rural areas. 
I just want to bring to the again to attention of everyone that cooperation in India is a state subject or it's a provincial subject. As per the Constitution of India, and only local governments can play a crucial and a key role in their functioning. In view of the structure of the cooperatives in India, is varied from province to province, that is from the state to state. The developments are also different from states to states. So I just want to make uh, a kind of a distinction between the two types of types of cooperatives. We have functional cooperatives in the country. These cooperatives are involved in providing numerous support and the linkage services to the farmers and also other community-based entities. They deal with the dairy, fertilizers, forest produce, fruits, vegetables, weavers, irrigation, etc. The world famous Amul model, many of you might have heard about it, it's the milk uh, supply chain, which is a three-tier structure for milk procurement and marketing is the best example of such functional cooperatives. And the next one is the credit cooperatives. Credit cooperatives are involved in only providing the financial services like other banking or financial institutions, especially to the credit deprived rural areas and also the farmers. So now I just want to bring uh, again the entire gamut of the cooperative operations in the country. The rural co cooperative credit structure is broadly classified into the short-term structure and also the long-term structure. The short-term structure is primarily catering to the credit for the crop operations and uh, the crop loan requirements, while the long-term cooperatives makes credit available for capital formation, agriculture, rural industries, etc. So the Cooperative Societies Act of the respect to states guides the functioning of the cooperative banks in India. The cooperatives have a huge network and are a dominant player in providing agricultural loans, as can be seen from the, maybe from the statistics, which we always read about it. Now we have close to around 34 state level cooperative banks with close to around 28 seven point billion dollars of the maybe loan portfolio. While we have a second tier uh, structure that is called the district level central cooperative banks, it's close to around $38.7 billion worth of uh, portfolio. While we have close to around 100,000 primary agricultural credit societies, this is the last tier in the entire cooperative system with around $16 billion as their portfolio. And we have a long term structure which is very small with regard to the portfolio, close to around $2.8 billion. Now here, I just want to uh, bring again, really how the cooperatives are playing a very crucial role at one point of a time. And today also, despite their playing a crucial role, how their share is uh, sliding down. Now take the case of <clears throat> the country, the moment we got the independence, somewhere in 1947, we got the independence. And uh, in 1950, when we took the first, uh, maybe the cooperative statistics, if I look into it, that time the whole of the agricultural credit was hardly anything and the cooperatives were catering almost to the 100%. While in 1988, 89, that is almost up to close to around 30 years, the cooperative share had dwindled to 44%. By the next decade, by 99, 2000, when the entire agricultural credit had gone up to $10 billion, <clears throat> the cooperative share had been reduced to 40%. In 2004-05, the agricultural credit had rose, uh, risen to close to around $25 billion and the cooperative share had been reduced to 25%. In 2009-10, the cooperative, the total agricultural credit had risen to $64 billion and the cooperative credit had slided to 17%. While the latest year, which just now we conclude on 31st March, the whole of the agricultural credit was to the tune of around $210 billion, while cooperatives could deliver only 12%. I am not uh, saying that cooperatives have not done their job, but thing is, the, the way the agricultural credit is growing, the cooperatives are not able to keep pace with that kind of a growth, and the institutions which were catering almost 100% at one point of a time, or maybe 50% even at the turn of the century, had been reduced to 12%. And 
And the basic reason is uh, that maybe one is because of their uh, various governances, and the other one is with regard to the digitization, which they could not embark. So that is what I just want to bring to uh, the information of the uh, August gathering. The rural cooperative credit structure was the sole purveyor of the agricultural credit. As I told that at one point of a time, it was so good, 100%. And the ratio at that time, when it was 100%, the non-institutional players were playing a very big role. That is the money lenders. But now, actually, all those things have been changed. Government of India had brought a nationalization of the banks of the country in 1969, which had brought a sea change with the complexion of the entire banking system in the country. Subsequently, there was a competitor, maybe for the cooperatives, that is called the regional rural banks have come into being, which were having the local feel of the cooperative, but at the same time, the operational efficiency of the commercial banks. So now when both the things are happened, these uh, institutions started carving a niche for themselves. While in 1988-89, as I told that uh, cooperatives were having a share of around 44%, with around, uh, when the credit was around $25.8 billion, that same thing had drastically reduced to 12.2% right now. In absolute terms, the credit provided by cooperatives grew by more than 6,000% in 30 years. Again, as I told earlier, that the, I'm not undermining the importance of cooperatives, but at the same time, the relative share has gone down, though they are absolute terms, they are growing at the rate of 6,000% in 30 years. As I told that the percentage terms, it's a really abysmal growth. And the ground level credit, as I told that this year, we have made a record and next year it is going to be much higher. But at the same time, the cooperatives have to pull up their socks to see that they also get a, maybe a better share of this one. So the last five decades saw a major changes in the Indian banking system. The nationalization of the banks and also the growth of branch network took shape from the 1969, as I told, and now we have a plethora of banking agencies which are doing the things. And also, the turn of the century has also witnessed the emergence of technology like core banking, software, internet, and mobile banking. Now, India is one of the fastest growing technology nations in the world, and most of the banks are already on the technology platforms, and uh, Indian companies, software companies, are some of the best technology providers to the world. But again, I just want to give a pause and say, but the cooperatives have ceded their share to commercial banks, private sector banks, regional rural banks during the last two decades. And at the present times, actually, they are ceding their share even to the non banking finance companies microfinance institutions, and also to the very late entrants like small finance banks. What are the lessons learned by all of us in this one? As we told, uh, we have seen that India's demographic profile is changing very fast. And today we have 60% of the population below the age of 35 years who are tech savvy and they want instant solutions. And India is again dominated by small and marginal farmers with 86% of them of the 140 million holdings are falling under this category. Now, these people want to do the banking, but thing is with a technological finesse. Solutions for this entire new age farmer required urgently to enable him to stay put in agriculture. Collectivization of farmers, adoption of technology by primary societies, and repositioning of the primary societies as a multi-service organizations is the key to ensure success of small farm operations. Again, I just want to put in inverted that the collectivization of the farmers, adoption of technology by all the types, and especially the primary societies, and also <coughs> converting them into the multi-service societies is the key to do all these kinds of a good small farm operations. So the cooperative banks in our country have lagged by nearly two decades in adoption of digital technology as compared to the, maybe the others, not only in India, but also elsewhere. And the, the primary societies whose members are the farmers have also not computerized their operations in any meaningful way, as I told. If the cooperative credit structure expects to play any meaningful role in agricultural sector in the country, there is a need 
to urgently adopt a digital platform or a digital strategies in a big way so that their working including providing high tech solutions to all their farmer members will be realized however before embarking on the digitization and digital adoption there is a need to address certain issues that continue to plague the cooperative structure as i was hearing carries thing that maybe in the united states probably there may not be much of the issues with regard to the governance of these banks and also maybe the disclosures transparency kyc internal control systems and risk management but in case of uh, india maybe with regard to the cooperatives all these things have got some issues or other and they have to be addressed before even embarking on a very big way to the digital strategies so what are the maybe the prerequisites for embracing the digital technology in cooperatives as you are aware the cooperatives are member driven institutions and the board of cooperative bank that is a society or a bank comprises of members who are elected by other members of the society the members of the board need to infuse professionalism in their approach and match their peers in the commercial bank and also that may be in the cooperative structures like maybe canada us germany and other countries such kind of a professionalism has to be there then the reserve bank of india that is the central bank of this country has prescribed the fit and proper criteria for the ceo of for the cooperative banks this needs to be strongly adhered to bring about a transformation in approach by the members the governance mechanism like audit committees risk management committee alco inspection and audit need to be robust and function in a transparent manner this is still is a work in progress in most of the cooperative banks in the country nabad as the as we told that national bank for agriculture and rural development is the apex financial institution which is giving the refinance to the cooperatives and also it does the supervision of the cooperatives it does the inspections everything nabad had recently introduced a corporate governance index that would serve as a self evaluation tool for banks and enable them to take self corrective action banks are strongly encouraged to undertake this exercise at least on an annual basis further in order to able to provide internet banking to its customers the reserve bank of india has also prescribed certain eligibility requirements that is the crar capital to risk weighted assets ratio of minimum 10% it should be there net worth of 50 crores or more as on 31st march then the gross nps should be less than the 7% and net sp nps should not be more than 3% and the bank should have made a profit in the immediate preceding financial year and overall should have made a net profit in the last 3 years it should not have defaulted in the maintenance of slr and crr and also sound internal control systems with two professional directors so the bank should have a track record of regulatory compliance and no monetary penalty has been imposed now these are all the conditions which have to be fulfilled to enable them to go whole hog into the digital kind of a transformation so compliance to these eligibility parameters is essential for the banks to go digital in a big way then how we'll proceed ahead now that is how actually now actually having listened to uh, maybe the presentation from united states where you have maybe a better ecosystem uh, with regard to because these cooperatives which are talking maybe it may be urban cooperative kind of a thing in the country but thing is here we are dealing with the rural cooperative structure which requires maybe a different kind of a dispensation and also a treatment that's why there should be a systematic approach and need for working on all fronts i will say the first point is that the business model and digital channels there should be a different kind of a business model has to be put the face to face banking has been the usp of a cooperative banking system in the country however in the absence of other channels the tech savvy farmers and also the other customers are shying away from these institutions so the basic model has to undergo a change so for that the digital channels and products have to be devised and which are the digital channels which we have that is the second point which i just want to do it that is they should strive to offer digital channels like the rupee kisan credit cards mobile banking or internet banking apart from the brick and mortar services the banks are doing it 
Now, pay, that they should have a direct benefit transfer. Now, the government of India is transferring quite a lot of money through the direct benefit transfer, but these institutions are still yet to be geared up to do such kind of a thing. So, there should be a direct benefit transfer mechanism for various payments, and also the cooperatives should embrace the technology to enable it. So, this is uh, yeah. we're, we're, we're coming up on uh, about 20 minutes to the top of the hour. So if I could ask you to, to just yeah, wrap in up another, your thoughts. In another five minutes, another five minutes I will take, yeah. Then the next one is the digital banking products. Actually, now these are the things which we need to devise and already it's a work in progress which we are doing. Then the next one is with regard to the e-marketplace and also the mobile apps. Now, actually, whatever Carrie was telling, like most of the things, the products are available, the systems are available. But thing is how actually the, all these things should be tuned to the cooperative banking system. These are the things which we have to look into it. And right now we are doing in that work is in the progress. Having highlighted all these four points, I just want to say that we cannot ignore one of the major thing that is the ecosystem development. Now actually that is investing in the digital alone will not take cooperatives to the next level. Actually, they have to do quite a lot of it, uh, maybe the investments into the digital systems and they have to do some kind of awareness programs to the beneficiaries, to the members, to the board members, to everyone. Then these are the things which we are trying to look into it in a much bigger way. NABAD, as the agency which is uh, nurturing the cooperatives, we have done quite a lot of things in the previous one decade, and that is why now most of the Apex cooperative banks and also the second tier institution, that is the district central cooperative banks are the, the core banking systems. And most of them are able to offer the ATM services, Rupee Kisan credit card, et cetera. And also we have created maybe the computerized operation of the primary society. So now that is the last mile which we have to do it. So now in case if you have to make this entire cooperative system very tech savvy, the last mile connectivity also has to be on the tech platform. So now why I just want to tell about this one is having reached the $210 billion of that rural credit, and the cooperative share was just around $25 billion. That is around 12% of it. Now, by 2025-26, the country as a whole is going to reach close to around $350 billion of rural credit. And that time, whether we would like the cooperatives to remain at 12% or they should garner the share of 25%. If they have to garner the 25% of the share, which is equal to $60 billion, I think they have to fast track their digital kind of a thing where we are all trying to do this one. But at the same time, I'll say that it is not an overnight venture, but a continuous process and where everyone is trying to look into it to see. Lastly, before concluding, I will say that Reserve Bank of India, that is the central bank of this country, yesterday had issued a circular saying that in case if the banks have to merge, that is that maybe the de-merger layering of the cooperatives can happen, that they can do this one and that they are trying to do this that so that the IT systems can become very robust because of the higher outlays of the finances these merged entities can bring. So these are the things which uh, are going to uh, maybe change the face of the cooperatives in the days to come. And finally, I will say that it's a strong governance and management practices backed by the robust IT system would lead to a greater transparency in the working of the bank. And that is what we are trying to look into it. Now, the technology is not a problem. Man and material are not a problem. The problem is that ecosystem has to change and transform itself. That is where we are all working in the country. Thank you. I thank you for giving a patient hearing. Thank you all. And thank you, Dr. Chintala. It's very thorough. Uh background and then of where were they were in India with cooperative banks and, and technology and, and where they're going now. And it sounds like there are still some challenges. So we appreciate that presentation. We're going to switch back to the credit union world now to hear from Dohun Kwan, IT Platform Quality Assurance Officer for the National Credit Union Federation of Korea, or NACUFOLK, a World Council Direct Member Association representing nearly 800 credit unions in South Korea. He is here to talk about NACUFOLK's digitization vision for those credit unions. Mr. Kwan. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I, 
Kim Da Kwon Do Hoon, that I will introduce the Korean the Credit Union IT system today. It's a great uh, to be invited as a speaker uh, for uh, today's uh, webinar. And uh, I am the working uh, for the IT uh, de uh, uh, department with the, the NAFCOC, so I will provide more practical tips uh, about the IT system at the NAFCOC. And uh, the slide, what you are looking at is the topics that I'm going to touch upon for the next 15 to 20 minutes or so. I will focus on the NAFCO systems and the main functions and the integration of credit unions to NAFCO IT system. These are the main topics that I will touch upon today. So first, uh, uh, let me start with the overview of the NAFCO system. Uh, the NAFCO IT department uh, is uh, divided into IT development, uh, IT planning and uh, management, and uh, IT information uh, protection. IT development uh, is uh, responsible for system development uh, for the credit unions, and the most of the program the development and the maintenance is uh, done by this uh, division. On the IT planning and the management, there are uh, information technology planning team, the quality management team, and the IT infrastructure team. They handle most of IT related tasks except for us development. So uh, they handle the human resources and the budget as well. And uh, last, the information protection division. Uh, this uh, division that takes care of IT security related tasks, such as a firewall, the security programs. And uh, recently, privacy uh, emerged as an important issue in the Korean financial sector. Uh, so this led to establishment of a personal credit information system, uh, information team. So let me move on. So at present, there are 886 credit unions, uh, of which uh, 80 uh, 60 use a NAFCO system, the 15 of them they use a legacy IT system, and the uh, six use their own system. So one thing to note is that the number of credit unions that use it, the uh, next generation is decreasing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the number of transactions has been uh, increasing as well as uh, the number of accounts that you can see from the, this uh, table on this uh, slide. And uh, that uh, shows uh, the expansion of a contactless uh, channel and so this is one of the trends that, that can be identified from this number. And this slide shows an IT center network diagram. Uh, lastly, it is divided into blue and the purple parts. Blue represent the network used in the BAU situation. And this uh, network is uh, presented uh, with the, the black arrow line, the, which is uh, the private network. Uh, so it is uh, secure against uh, the external attack. And the purple part represents uh, the backup network uh, to be used uh, when disaster or uh, incident uh, occurs. And it is uh, connected to public uh, uh, internet and uh, uh, it is operated with a VPN. And the, the main data are highlighted in blue uh, in the previous page is located in the server room. And uh, it is built with the seismic design and it has uh, emergency power generator uh, with the temperature and the humanity chamber. The purple uh, represent the disaster recovery center Critical systems that, that must be recovered within the three hours uh, included here. So the size is a lot smaller than the main data center. And it is located in the uh, Gangnam-gu, Seoul, uh, 
it's uh, a 100 kilometer away from the uh, main center, uh, main data center. So this uh, the digester recovery center size is a lot smaller than the main data center. So um, let me now share the digitalization the vision the, for Korean the credit unions. And uh, let's IT is uh, our digital uh, slogan, uh, which means the uh, leading IT, earnest IT, trusted IT, and service. And uh, this uh, slogan suggests uh, starting a new jersey uh, by putting our members at a center. Let me elaborate on this part uh, in the later slide. So to implement uh, let's uh, IT a solution, uh, we are trying to provide uh, the leading technology and the focusing on the communication, the active communication and the offering and the reliable services and the expansion of communication and the limited uh, incident is the goal of this IT slogan, uh, Let's IT. In order to uh, implement the data uh, IT, uh, so we have uh, laid out that the four strategy and the two are related to uh, providing user uh, oriented digital services. And uh, uh, it is also related to building the digital business model for credit unions. So I think you have heard of open banking a lot. And uh, open banking means uh, uh, sharing the data among uh, banks uh, uh, so that uh, user-oriented uh, application can be developed based on the, this the shared data. So, and the IPA, what this means is RPA is a robot-based automation process and that improves the convenience of employees. So having a robot take care of reparative and routine tasks improve business efficiency. So on behalf of credit unions, uh, so promoting e-banking and helping and developing online and a mobile product on behalf of a credit union is a part of our strategy for the digitalization. For example, Nafuko recently raised a 1 million own bank campaign. And so Nafuko carried out this campaign on behalf of the entire credit unions. And so we have also uh, made the process uh, to uh, make a filing to the regulatory automatic so that uh, the uh, AML and the uh, other uh, important regulatory reportings and the files that can be done automatically. And now let me uh, talk about the, the main IT uh, functions. So here, I would like to talk about the main technologies used by credit unions. I just uh, going to share just the three technologies in my presentation. Uh, first, uh, let me introduce uh, the Palm the Vein, which was recently introduced. Uh, palm uh, Vein is more accurate than the Finger Vein. Since this is based on the biometric information, uh, if it is hacked, then it's irreversible. So credit unions and the external uh, bodies share the half of the data uh, so that the biometric information can be securely uh, stored. And for the authentication, and the half of the data held by a credit union and the external body is used together uh, to uh, go through the authentication process. And this slide shows that the back office support provided by NAFCO. CSS, BSS, CRS are the uh, about 
uh, the supports uh, for the credit and the budget, uh, which are important part of the credit union business. And uh, analyzing the credit uh, information of our members, uh, we uh, introduced the latest credit analysis model on a regular basis. And uh, so uh, also we provide the various uh, statistics uh, reports and it is important. And uh, we also respond to the development request from the credit unions as well. So now uh, let me share the payment uh, settlement system, which is designed by BOK and the KFTC for the transactions uh, among the financial institutions. And uh, uh, actually uh, hundreds of uh, millions of transactions take place uh, every day. So it is uh, very inefficient to move money physically every time when the transaction takes place. So instead the financial institutions open the account at the BOK and the KFTC collect the transactional data from the financial institutions and collect, calculate the sum the next day and then make a bulk settlement. And the NAFCO uh, plays the uh, intermediary role uh, for the transactions uh, among the credit unions. So NAFCO plays the role of KFTC uh, for the credit unions. Now, I uh, will uh, discuss uh, the advantages using NAFCO platform and uh, the integration. Uh, with the integration of NAFCO, uh, credit unions can uh, have uh, better services, uh, for example, image storing service and the security uh, programs. Uh, can be provided uh, from the NAFCO system and uh, that uh, reduces uh, the cost and uh, expenses. And the group where website, the email, and the messengers uh, are provided uh, from uh, the integration system. And uh, this uh, helps uh, the communication among the employees uh, at the credit union. From the data perspective, uh, NAFCO uh, system that uh, provide uh, various uh, screens uh, to collect the critical information for business. And these uh, integration data system, not only good for the data analysis, uh, but also this uh, helps uh, to do better statistics. Uh, now let's look at from the operational perspective. Uh, since uh, uh, the common IT center is shared, that means uh, uh, no double uh, investment in the purchasing the hardware and the building the network. And also uh, for the recovery, uh, digital recovery center uh, saves money uh, for the credit union as well. And so integration system is more beneficial for the bigger size of the transaction volume. And this is the last chapter I would like to touch upon in the presentation. And so that's about the requirement of the integration of a NAFCO platform. So in the early days of the integration, uh, there was some the oppositions against uh, you know, being integrated into the NAFCO system. Uh, that's uh, because uh, the circumstances uh, under which uh, credit unions are in are different. Uh, and uh, so there is a, some the, against the, the change to uh, using the common the terminal. So there was uh, some the opposition at the beginning, uh, but and uh, also some credit unions so uh, are just uh, satisfied with uh, just uh, providing simple uh, transactional services uh, to the members. So, so they also opposed the, the integration into NAFCO platform. To address uh, these oppositions, so what uh, we do was uh, we allow the, the credit the unions uh, uh, can uh, choose and pick uh, services that they need from the NAFCO. So the credit unions had uh, the option to choose from 
And uh, also depending on the size and uh, the credit unions are paid the different uh, charges. So that means uh, we allow the autonomy and they give us some of the uh, independence uh, to uh, credit unions in using the integrated system of NAPCO. And let me uh, talk about the requirements more. And the first infrastructure requirement include the two uh, dedicated line and the one BPN installment is required. And uh, at least uh, two terminals are needed uh, for one trader and the other one is for the approver. And also uh, security programs need to be installed. And these are also another requirements and the internally, it installed a, a private uh, line that should be used uh, for the NAFCO uh, platform. And uh, these uh, requirements, it's not uh, just uh, uh, for the uh, NAFCO requirement, and uh, these are the part of the government regulation that, that the credit unions must uh, follow. And uh, from the policy perspective, uh, new credit unions uh, need to pay uh, IT fund contribution for the last uh, five years. And the uh, IT contribution that should be paid every year. And uh, the ch uh, service charges are for using the private uh, network and the dedicated line that should be paid. And this uh, IT funds uh, contribution are approved by IT committee. And the, the members of this uh, committee are mostly uh, composed of the chairman of the credit unions. Uh, this uh, uh, prevent NAFCO uh, from the single-handedly increasing the uh, contribution or increasing the set up uh, excessive budget that to increase uh, the contribution. Uh, that's all I have for today. And uh, mainly I was uh, focusing on the introducing the uh, NAFCO uh, IT system. And if you have any questions, then uh, I would like to entertain the, your questions. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for the interpretation as well. Uh, and Duhan, very interesting. Unfortunately, we are running quite a bit over time here. So we're going to have to move on without any questions. Um, if you do have questions for NACUFOC uh, and Duhan, uh, please put them in the Q&A. We will try to get those to him afterwards. Uh, but we do have one more presentation. And we do appreciate you hanging around with us uh, for a little bit of extra time here. We are finally going to be joined by Miroslav Skiba and Wajay Mika, they are respectively the president and vice president of the board for SGB Bank, SA and Associating Bank for 192 cooperative banks in Poland that form a network of over 1500 bank branches and online access channels with state-of-the-art technology. Gentlemen. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you very much for the invitation. This is really great pleasure to be here. And thank you also for some short uh, introduction, because I recognize that in fact, uh, uh, we have a lag of one slide, which describes a little bit our activity in Poland. So, so this is, as, uh, as was mentioned, so that um, we associate uh, about 190 um, cooperative banks, which uh, uh, operate through the uh, 1,500 branches operates uh, uh, in the whole um, Poland. <clears throat> Our business model um, uh, traditional based on the quite traditional, uh, let me say model based on the branches in the past. And uh, a little bit more than two years ago, we decided uh, uh, to change this model. And we uh, decided uh, observing what's going on around us. We saw that to be able to compete with uh, uh, different banks to, to be able to um, grow in the not only current but also in the in the future, we have to change ourselves. We have to go much more to the digital. But instead of uh, trying to build, trying to start to build, um, you know, very deep, um, uh, very 
uh, detailed prepared strategy, di digital strategy, you know, we decided to go uh, firstly, and the first step, we decided to go to the uh, mobile uh, banking because um, the, the, our group had, uh, in fact, in already have um, five uh, accountants, um, uh, uh, IT systems. Uh, they have also seven uh, electronic um, uh, banking um, system as well uh, available to the uh, customers. But uh, in the past two years ago, we do not, we, we didn't have um, uh, mobile app. Currently, the situation is completely different, which uh, I will show you during next uh, few uh, next few. Uh, minutes um, today, uh, we are on the um, on the on the stage that, uh, in fact, two few weeks ago, we agree uh, the the full the new strategy for the whole group. Five pillars, uh, the main pillars, of course. Uh, on the previous slide, if I, if I can ask you, <clears throat> you see that uh, we have the first. Um, this is of course customer satisfaction. The second one is the group prosperity. It's, it's, uh, we emphasize very strongly that uh, all our members, the all our um, of, um, um, cooperative banks has to feel not only members, a strong membership, but also uh, they should uh, feel also the, the, the business case uh, which, which works for, for them. And as you see, the, the, the third pillar is the digital strength. Which, which we are, would extend uh, in the on the next um, slides effectiveness uh, and so of course uh, employees and, and locality which we emphasize that this is our nature this is uh, our group um, we are local banks and we, we want to still be a local bank on the next slide you see that uh, what we mean in terms of digital strengths that for sure the Digitalization, we treat as an opportunity, for sure as an opportunity, which, which, you, which you will see. We concentrate also um, uh, in the next few months, and in fact, maybe even years, to build a multi-channel platform based on open banking for, for cooperative banks, for all, all cooperative banks. And of course, um, the, the very important um, is that SGB uh, platform will, uh, will uh, uh, deliver a completely new uh, level of service um, for our uh, customers. Um, I think, um, in fact, as you see, um, the digital part, the digitalization is really, really very strong, um, extremely strong part of our whole strategy. We didn't build the uh, separated digital strategy for the for our group, but we include the digitalization as an integral part of our strategy for next four years. And uh, what is also extremely important that uh, the strategy was prepared with huge involvement, not also not only from the SGB bank as a central bank for the. For the um, for uh, for the group, but we uh, encourage, we invite uh, uh, our participants, our cooperative banks or representatives to build together the strategy. As a result, was that um, the strategy was accepted, in fact, uh, without any vote against. So so it it, it gives us uh, as Strong, very strong mandate to implement uh, uh, what we what we prepare, including uh, digitalization. Uh, which uh, now I, I will pass to, to the voice to uh, to Boaje, uh, who in the details uh, show you what in practice how we see the digitalization in a very practical way. Thank you very much. Thank you that I can uh, share my vision and my experience with the digital world here in uh, SGB Bank and uh, share the, what we have done up till now about the, this digitalization or, or digital uh, 
uh, change. As Mirek said, of course, I really believe that this uh, uh, opportunity that we can link the digital with our local presence in uh, Poland and we are able based on these three pillars shown on this previous slide that we are able to deliver to our banks in our association let's say our way to uh, to move to the uh, digital the fundamental change is based on the multi-platform and uh, uh, based on the open banking because as you, as you heard, uh, we have some challenges from the technologi technological and IT perspective. We don't have one core system. We have five different core system within the banks and we don't have the one uh, internet uh, banking. So the question was first, how to integrate all this uh, uh, different uh, solution where IT staff and uh, uh, banks have some, let's say, independence with uh, choosing the uh, different platforms. And this question was raised during then we, when we were developing our digital strategy. And the answer was the open banking. We based on the, because we are in Europe, of course, there is a payment uh, service directive, the PSD2, and we had to have uh, developed the uh, API standards, Polish API standards. So based on this, we develop something which is called uh, BS API. And this is a platform when we try to integrate, integrate this different uh, 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 solution. And this is a one part. The second is the answer for the question, what is important for us when we are building the, uh, this digital uh, uh, world and I think we very let's say similar what was said during this uh, today uh, webinar first of all we have to observe our customers we have to observe the uh, the trends we we have to see what are the needs of our customers in the uh, digital uh, world second is simplicity we cannot move our old traditional approach to the digital world. We very often need to build something from the scratch, something which must be seamless, easy to use, uh, uh, focus on uh, our uh, 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 customers. We should also focus on the long-term investment. We, we need to invest in, in the IT, in the technology, but focus on the uh, long term, not only uh, short term. And we need to have uh, people who understand this world, who understand this change. They uh, must be a part of this uh, change. So we must convince banks, people, to uh, to be in line with the uh, with the our digital strategy and of course there is a lot of based on these three pillars there are a lot of uh, opportunities because it gives to our banks possibility to choose we open the business for new opportunities for example giving them new channels like mobile we didn't have mobile app last year now we have during using the mobile uh, app we can offer new services we can sell products and so on so we can also cooperate with uh, uh, our suppliers based on this open banking uh, standards so we can i usually say that we can link the different dots because i can sometimes it's difficult for me to develop some solution so I can invite our par partners, our FinTech to deliver some uh, uh, solutions. So it's about collaboration. Uh, it's about, uh, about uh, cooperation. So it gives uh, us also new uh, business opportunities. This all gives us the new client uh, acquisition because we, again, we are developing new 
uh, new world. And finally, for me, it's a win-win for all parts, banks, which are with our association, external partners, even FinTech, and also for, uh, for us. And based on this, we had, if we could move on the next slide, we have quite successful story uh, from the uh, perspective last year. And the last year, as we know, wasn't easy because we, we have uh, uh, COVID, we have to change our business model in Poland. It was uh, the, we have the lowest uh, interest rate. So the, the banks had to change the um, uh, business model, but we didn't stop any project. What we plan, we deliver, starting from internet banking development. It, it was a huge progress to make this more functional, more focus oriented. We implemented strong authentication uh, because uh, under the uh, PSD2, we, we have to provide uh, uh, such a, a solution. Durable medium is a way how we communicate with uh, customers. So we can provide the, for example, statements for, uh, for them in electronic uh, way. During the COVID, the Polish government decided to uh, give a lot of uh, finance uh, help to uh, uh, companies. So we had to develop a special program and distribute this finance to our uh, customers. It was all done digitally, no paper, everything was done the, uh, digitally. Then of course, the most important is a mobile application. It works, uh, it's linked with the five different core system. It's based on this API, in this uh, base uh, API standard and it works and uh, 155 banks, they are offering this to the customers, to customers and till now, just today, we, uh, we achieve one, 100,000 uh, customers. We didn't have a one call center for all the group of banks, now we have. We also inter introduced something which is called in Poland, digital identity. It helps to our customers to communicate with government. For example, if you want to register for a COVID vaccine, you use this to log in to the uh, health system. And this is done by the, uh, through the uh, bank mobile application. Also, we develop 3D Secure in a mobile to have a stronger auto authentication for the uh, uh, cards payments. And in the last uh, year, also we um, introduced online sales. So now our customers can buy uh, cards digitally. So you don't have to wait for your plastic. You can issue the card, virtual card in a, a mobile application, then you can add this to the uh, wallet and then you can pay and it's done everything um, online. That was possible because we have, we cooperate closely with uh, Visa and uh, MasterCard. We develop a token uh, connect. For example, in our mobile application, we have the information where the cards are stored, what uh, subscriptions uh, the customer have, so can, then the customers can uh, simply switch on and switch off the uh, subscription. If you could, could move to the next slide and everything this uh, was possible uh, because we developed this uh, uh, base API and we uh, cooperate with uh, uh, our partners like uh, Visa, uh, KIR, which is a, a Polish uh, settlement association, also with the, our uh, 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 suppliers. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Okay, please next. And the last thing in the, in, in, in the end, uh, 
that's the our vision that, that's the our uh, eco uh, ecosystem so the we are working with uh, 1.5 million uh, customers almost 190 cooperative banks and this account systems and of course which is more uh, which is the most important for me in our strategy that this cooperation with our uh, partners uh, who are providing the the different solution uh, uh, solution and it helps us to connect these uh, uh, dots and the last slide is about the future as uh, miroslav said our future is uh, linked to the new platform which is called sgb uh, 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 platform and this platform will cover all the digital uh, uh, processes all the sales all the uh, uh, functionality for banks and uh, um, uh, customers if, if you could click the because there's an animation i think uh, on the oh thank you so as you can see there are different uh, functionalities and uh, uh, different possibility to uh, use and this platform will integrate based on this base api this different five core uh, banking uh, system and this will be a center of our uh, digital uh, uh, approach for future um, uh, development that's all in very very uh, uh, brief because i i know we are a little bit after the time so once again thank you for possibility to share a little bit from our uh, digital uh, approach and experience thank you so much Blaje, and thank you miroslaw that uh, really it's interesting because for us because our member in poland uh Naxkew, that also has very advanced digitization. It looks like Poland is really heading in the right direction when it comes to this. So we appreciate your time. Um, we are a little over time. So unfortunately, we aren't going to have time for questions. If you do have any, please put them in the Q&A. You can also email them to communications at woku.org. That's communications at woccu.org. And we can get them to the uh, different speaker who you would like to answer them or address them. But we do want to thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar was recorded. It'll be available later today on the World Council YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Woku. And if you're looking to continue learning about credit union topics ranging from communications to digitization, advocacy, and more, be sure to register for the World Credit Union Conference. It's going to be taking place all virtually this year from July 14th to the 21st. If you're interested, you can register at wcuc.org. We hope to see you there. Thank you.